Well, hello and welcome to this first conversation style piece for the 2022 series of the Gilbert Scott Lectures on Science and Faith at Liverpool Cathedral in the UK. My name is Canon Mike Kirby and I'm the Canon Scientist at the Cathedral and it's a delight to welcome you. If you found us via the Cathedral website, you'll already know something of the history of these lecture series. If you found us another way, please keep watching at the end for an information slide on where to find out more about the series and how to sign up to our Cathedral email newsletter, which is the best way to be informed of upcoming conversations, lectures and podcasts within the series. And indeed, all of what's happening at Liverpool Cathedral, a place of encounter with God in so many ways a God who knows and loves us at all times and in all situations. So I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Bethany Solorede to this first In Conversation piece with me. Bethany was a postdoctoral fellow in science and religion at the University of Oxford, with a particular interest in the engagement of practical and systematic theology and bridging the gap between academic theodicy and practical pastoral need a Fellow of the International Society of Science and Religion and a Fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. She is now a lecturer in Science and Religion within the School of Divinity at the University of Edinburgh. Bethany, welcome to this conversation. It's a delight to have you be the first to do this as part of our ongoing series. So let's begin by asking what is theodicy in the first place and what is compassionate theodicy and for the ordinary person in the street, why should we care? Yeah, it's a great set of questions. Uh, the Odyssey is a, a word that was coined by Leibniz uh, in, in his book of that name, The Odyssey. And it basically means the, the justice of God. And so if we think of Milton's attempt in Paradise Lost to justify the ways of God to man, that's sort of the project of the Odyssey when we when we encounter uh, suffering, when we encounter pain, when we encounter evil, and we think, why would a good and loving God allow this to happen? Trying to answer that is what theodicy does. Now, of course, that is an ancient pursuit. I mean, it goes all the way back to ancient Egyptian sources of sort of the noble peasant, you know, protesting the gods and saying this, this world isn't fair. Um, but the project of theodicy in particular, as it's emerged uh, in, in the sort of enlightenment, tries to go beyond sort of asking God why God might doing it in the relationship between, you know, creature and creator. And it, it becomes much more of a philosophical game where professional philosophers try to address the uh, protests of skeptics who are often atheist or agnostic. Um, and so it, it becomes a very sort of rarefied exchange that's caught up in big words and formal logic and really becomes very divided from the world you and I experience. So all of the examples are sort of the worst horrors of the you know of the human race whereas most of us thank goodness don't experience that in our day-to-day -day lives we experience you know death and illness around us we experience you know the betrayal of a friend but most of us are not going through you know um experiences like the shoah the holocaust or you know genocide and that sort of things and those kinds of questions are absolutely important but I think it's very difficult for those of us who haven't experienced something like that to try and give an answer for them. So when you ask what is compassionate theodicy, I thought, well, what about theodicy for the rest of us? Um, not necessarily for professional philosophers, but for those of us who just encounter day to day suffering in the world, what we see on the news at night. Um, but also, how can we make uh, the theodicy as theodicy part of either a therapeutic process or part of a spiritual process of building our relationship with God. So whereas, you know, theodicy formally has this very um, small audience that has very strict rules, I sort of thought, you know, how do we open this up to 
the the concerns of everyday people and allow it to be part of their journey uh either you know to god or away from god as as the case may be but where they begin to take um authorship of what they believe rather than sort of saying um you know an expert can tell me the meaning of suffering i think that suffering is deeply personal and it really needs each person to understand it in their own particular place, in their own particular way. So un unlike many of the philosophers, I don't think there's a one size fits all solution. Um, and so Compassionate Theodicy is really about helping people come to, to create a solution. Um, and even solution is the wrong word, but you know, to, to, to create a frame of mind that helps them encounter the suffering that they're going to encounter. And I guess um, from what you were saying beforehand, really, that we don't generally, most of us don't encounter those really big uh, instances of suffering, really. Even for an individual, what they're going through is a big thing. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's an, it's an important issue or can be an important issue for them, really. And having it personalized is, is as personalized as the suffering or the or the uh, difficulty that they're going through. Yeah, and it's, it's exactly that. So the amount of suffering one goes through compared to the external situation one is in is not necessarily like a, a, a straight correlation. Yeah. So you have people who come out of, you know, refugee camps and are just, you know, experience the worst kind of suffering and uh and and yet they seem to be able to sort of handle that really well where somebody else experiences a slight amount of neglect or you know a slight amount of of painfulness or the world just doesn't quite match your expectations and they're totally devastated by it you know and so you know who is suffering more actually becomes a very difficult question to answer, which is again why I'm skeptical that sort of a philosopher sitting in a room like this full of books could could somehow say, ah, yes, I, I understand your pain and your suffering and have an answer for it. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, back in 2019, you organ, organized a highly successful summer conference at the Ian Ramsey Center at Oxford on compassion and theodicy, practice, thought and tradition. Indeed, it was at that conference that we met. And from then, I was keen to have you contribute to our work at Liverpool Cathedral. There were a very wide range of papers and presentations made in the conference from voices around the world. How did those works contribute to your own research and writing, Stephanie? Yeah. That was a really interesting conference because it was it was being hosted by the Ian Ramsey Center, which is the sort of science and religion hub at Oxford University. And typically when you run a conference in science and religion, there's sort of a usual crowd that comes along. There's, you know, a certain number of philosophers, a certain number of theologians, um, and then a certain number of scientists of a particular stripe, often physicists or biologists. Um, that conference really brought in a whole different crowd. We have a, a whole bunch of medical practitioners, counselors, and that sort of thing. So I thought it was a really, really um, just rich environment to get a conversation going about a topic we all care about in, in a way that um, was unusual for most of us. You know, so so we theologians spend less time talking to counselors, medical practitioners than we probably ought to. Yeah. And I think they often don't have a chance to, to chat with um, philosophers and theologians in the same way. And so it was it, it also drew in some great philosophers and, and theologians from around the world. So we had Eleanor Stump, we had Mark Scott, we had, you cool. know, a number of people that were just able to really uh, broaden the horizons of, of my own uh, research within my field, but then encountering other people um, brought it into some of the other disciplines. And I'm guessing that's really important when you wanted to widen things, you wanted to take things more down a further practical route, yeah. rather than necessarily being in a purely in a philosophical or academic uh, regime. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. 
uh, talking of writing your latest book, we'll put a plug up here really, and uh, we'll put information on this and we'll, we'll sell it through the Cathedral gift shop as well. Uh, the practical resource that you spoke about at the conference in 2019 is now out and it's entitled, Why is there suffering? Pick your own theological expedition, which is an intriguing title. Right? Details of which, as I say, will be on the webpage. Bethany, tell us something about the book, especially the rationale for the really interesting way in which you structured it. Yeah, so this is this is sort of modeled on the, the books that I read as a child called Choose Your Own Adventure novels. Uh, and they were they were books where you got to choose the the way that the plot developed. And so, you know, if you're Little Red Riding Hood walking through the forest and you came to a fork in the path, you could decide to go up to the castle by turning to page eight or down to the lake by turning to page 11. And so one of the things um, and that that's how this book works is that every couple of pages, you have a theological decision to make and where you decide to go with that keeps unfolding the sort of strategy that you're pursuing. So I'm going to just jump to the end and show this is sort of the full map of, of the possibilities of, of where you can follow. And then I set it because I think visually I set it within sort of a landscape, you know, so it becomes sort of pilgrim's progress, you can go up to the mountains of mystery, or you can go to the sort of high moors of atheism and, mm -hmm. and you can you can head around this world. So it's sort of an imaginative way to get in to the into the to the literature and the theological positions without without a being you know trained in all the jargon and all the sort of formal forms of logic but the thing that turned out to be really important when i talked to psychologists was people need a sense of agency if they're making meaning sort of being told this is how you should think about this question really doesn't help very much whereas being able to sort of make um uh, make meaning is really important to, to the therapeutic process of, of recovery from from a tragedy uh, and from a trauma, but also just in terms of uh, building building your own relationship with God. And so it was it was really attempted um, an attempt to facilitate that for people, so people can sort of play with these concepts. And so in order to keep it light, I mean, I have the whole sort of pilgrims progress thing, but I also don't use any really vicious examples of suffering. Um, so I think there's one chapter where I sort of rehearse the the Dostoevsky's um, uh, complaint of of Ivan in the Brothers Karamazov, where he you know he talks about some horrible things. So I I sort of make up a, a fake one. Um, which again is relatively mild, but I think one of the one of the things that I found when I was reading all the philosophy books that are out there was that the examples were so emotionally overwhelming that I, I couldn't think anymore. I couldn't I couldn't actually think about the options because I just wanted to sit there and weep. And so um, this this is intentionally a quite lighthearted approach to a really serious subject only so that you can you can actually think freely through the options without being re-traumatized by stories of suffering on every page i guess in a way also and as i say i, I only got the book, book this morning so i'm looking forward to reading it myself really and taking my own expedition with it um but just the cursory glance i'm i'm, I'm guessing that makes it really quite personal to the person who's reading it because it's their journey yeah. but do you think there might be also a danger for those who might be looking for an answer that it doesn't quite give the guidance to an answer rather they they've got to try and find their way through do you think that might be a little bit frustrating at times i don't know yeah i've had i've had divided uh, opinions on it so some some people have just loved it and they love the chance to explore they love the fact that i as the author trust them to use their own brain to come to views so some of the views in there i really like and i i support other ones i really don't like 
but I worked as hard as I could to make sure I wasn't creating any straw men. So wherever I wrote about a, a view that I don't like, I found somebody who holds that view and I said, you need to help me correct this. So yeah. the atheist path, for example, my colleague Richard Dawkins read it over and said, yeah, you know, yeah. you're good to go. You haven't misrepresented us, good. et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so some people are kind of either overwhelmed by the choice or um, find that, uh, you know, they, they, they do just want to be told an answer. And so I, I don't think that this is necessarily a book for everyone. I think that there are also big issues of timing. When, when something bad happens, the first thing to do isn't necessarily to try and put together a meaningful structure for it. it you know, the first thing to do is grieve and lament <laughs> and give your time, your body time to get over the shock. Um, but at some point when you're asking the questions, um, if people want books that say, I think this is the answer, there are plenty of really good books out there. So yeah. this is for the rest of us. Too. Yeah, and I see you've got a deep dip bibliography to, to help them on that journey if they want that as well. Yes, yeah. and that's my experience as well, depending where somebody is in that, in, in their own journey being alongside them is the first thing that, that we need to do rather than trying to come up with, with some very quick answers really as well. Yeah. At the cathedral, we've just had a wonderful Peter Walker exhibition uh, entitled Being Human with works filling the cathedral on connections and creativity, DNA, identity, and reflection. The latter helping us reflect on how we feel, especially through the pandemic and remembering those who've suffered and those we might have lost. It brought forward lots of questions on one's own thoughts on humanity and faith. And it's what inspired me to ask you to contribute, especially at this time. So Bethany, if I might inquire, where do your own experiences and or your own faith come into all of this? Have some of your own experiences helped to shape and direct really your work and research in it? Is that perhaps one of the reasons why you're doing this? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, so the, the whole reason that I, I end up doing a PhD in theodicy was basically to work out my own issues around that, my own struggles of faith and that sort of thing. Um, this idea of compassionate theodicy, that, that sort of one answer doesn't fit all, uh, really came out of personal experience as well. So I think it was in my second year, maybe it was the end of my second year, beginning of my third year of Bible college, you know, as an undergraduate. Um, I went through a really painful period with, with the church I was attending. And, you know, I remember just sort of asking God, why would you let this happen, this kind of thing. And of course, I was surrounded by Bible college students, so everybody had an answer, yeah. and uh, they weren't they weren't shy about about telling them to me. And my initial reaction was, you know, get away from me! You you don't understand. You don't you know. And I was really annoyed by people saying God has a plan for you or. You know, God's preparing you for, you know, I was just like, this is the worst. But the problem was that I actually knew these people and I knew that they had been through suffering that was not insignificant. And so they weren't giving me a pat answer. They were giving me the approach that helped sustain them through significant suffering. So I couldn't quite wave it aside as pa. You're just, you know, one of Job's comforters. They, they were, they were really giving me, and that, that made me wonder because I thought, wow, that, you know, whatever, you know, whatever approach it was that, that, that made me so angry at the time, um, for them that was really life's breath to them in their suffering. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, the exact opposite theological construction was life's breath to me and my suffering and so i sort of thought like oh actually i don't i don't think we really can come to one satisfying thing clearly our experience our personality our you know um the way that we've experienced things changes how we can relate to these theological models and i think we often think of things as the answer mm -hmm. rather than what they really are which is theological yeah. models 
you know, they're, they're our best attempt to describe something that's way bigger, way more complex than, than we can know. Um, and so there's no, I don't think that there's any danger in saying we don't have the full picture. We don't have, you know, it's not an exact science in that way. And um, we can we can mix and match to some extent without embracing the sort of liberal relativism mm -hmm. uh, because we know that we're dealing with mysteries. We know that we're dealing with things that we don't fully understand. And so we're we're trying, we're playing with our ideas um to see to see what works the other thing is that life experience can really affect how you um encounter something so for many people the model of god as father is really helpful it's one of protection and provision and it's a wonderful warm metaphor for god for others who've had really bad experiences with their fathers that becomes a point of, of distance and god is fortress you know, becomes more, more salient to them. It, it's a more helpful way to talk about God. That doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the model of God as father. It just it says that person's life experience has made that an unhelpful path. And I think it's a similar thing with, with the Odyssey that, that um, our life experiences can make certain types of explanation uniquely and the helpful even if there's validity in them. Yeah. That's interesting that you're bringing in those points of the individuals that offered comfort or even empathy and so on, and giving us a, an idea that there are different things, there are different ways that each of us are comforted in that diverse way. And that leads me on to my, my, my next question. I was wondering how much the voices of individuals, you've already mentioned people of faith and people of no faith really, help to bring practical and individual evidence into the work or is that within the book or is that in some of your other works really to hear those individual voices as evidence as what what people go through and what they think i i absolutely can say individual voices have had a, a, a massive impact on me whether it's the voices of those friends who um uh who have have spoken to me throughout times of suffering um or you know authors who speak to us both now and through the ages through through their words um i i mean i could mention some of the most you know the most impactful on me i think uh, eleanor stump who i mentioned mm -hmm. earlier um takes a view that i really generally don't like but i like it when she does it um, <laughs> And so her book, Wandering in Darkness, is really, really helpful. Uh, I love Robert Furr, Capo and the Third Peacock. It's it's a tiny little book. He has an absolutely mad style. So you can never sort of quote it because, you know, um, it it's just not quotable in, in yeah. academic circles. But it's a wonderfully profound uh reflection on the nature of the world that takes almost the opposite view from Eleanor Stump. Yeah. Um, but, but I love it as well. So I think, um, those, those are two books. Another one would be, uh, W.H. Vanstone's Love's Endeavor, Love's Expense, uh, which I, which I really found very, very helpful. Um, and so I think, I think, you know, I can, I can think about many of, of those, but I, I'd, I'd also just encourage people to, listen to the people around them to reach out to fellow humans because i think we often shy away from talking about the hard things we want to act like we've got it all together uh like we have the answers and so we often avoid conversations the really dark and the difficult and i think we we lose a depth of community because of that that's an interesting point for us to take away with us really so as as we go from this conversation it is so on that perspective, what's happening next uh, following your move to Edinburgh? Uh, will your research stay within this area or do you feel called to broaden into other horizons? Yeah, well, in the last couple of years um, through the pandemic, I was working on a project that was meant to be on ecological restoration. It got kiboshed by, by COVID, so I couldn't spend the time in the field uh, with, with uh, restoration ecologists as I had intended. Um, 
But continuing on with my uh, research history of all things grim and depressing, uh, I started thinking about climate change. And so I think that's more and more where I'm where I'm headed. So where where a majority of eco theologians kind of have something like, you know, if we can care for the earth as God intended it, we're all going to be OK and we can get out of this. Whereas I've been the one sort of thinking about what do we do if we can't stop climate change? What will that look like? Um, what does it mean theologically if we're facing uh, not only mass extinction, because we're already doing that of other creatures, but if we're looking at a significant diminishment of our own species, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, again, I think I think issues of, of migration, of suffering, of dislocation are, are not going away. I think they're going to get more and more important as, as the years go by. And I think that the Christian tradition has wonderful resources that we can that we can draw on to encounter that and also to prepare ourselves for suffering. It, it turns out that you can prepare for suffering. If you haven't prepared, it's really tough. Really tough. But there are ways where you can actually prepare for what's coming so that you have more resilience in in suffering. And, and so, you know, all, all my work in some ways, so it sort of shifted the focus from, you know, personal suffering to the, to the global challenge we're facing, but still with the same idea of we've got suffering coming our way. How are we going to encounter it? I think you've just painted beautifully your, your next, uh, next encounter with us, really. So we we'll look forward to you coming to either have a further conversation on your, on your next research uh, or coming and giving a lecture. That would be great. So finally, as we begin to wrap things up, what would be your take home message? Just going back to your book and your, you know, and your work on why is there suffering? What sort of message would you like to leave the listeners and viewers with? I think I would I would say something like don't don't be afraid to sort of tinker with your theology. Um, I remember when I was about 15, I had a, a, a friend and mentor who kind of said, you know, make sure you hang on to Jesus, you know, like like Jesus was a T-bar that you, you know, <laughs> on a zip line and you had to hold on really tight or you're going to fall in and hurt yourself. And I think I've sort of changed my view to seeing to seeing my relationship with Jesus more like, uh, you know, a zipline where I'm harnessed in. Uh, and, and so I can hang on. I can also let go. Both are going to be just fine, even if the journey is a bit harrowing at times. And so to know that being held in the love of God is much more important than, you know, the particulars of this kind of thing opens at least helped me open up to say you know uh i can i can explore views that i've been told are heretical i can explore views that you know i've been told are wrong and i can i can i can play with that i can come to it lightheartedly rather than thinking sort of you know my eternal salvation depends on holding on okay. to this one thing in just this way and i think um that has probably been more helpful to me in in making uh, doing theology a real joy uh, rather than coming out of a place of fear of I need to get it all right. So that's what I'd encourage people to do is be willing to ask hard questions. I, th I think that's a that's a great, uh, great message, a great way of actually opening our, ourselves up and our own minds up really. Bethany, it's been an absolute pleasure to have this brief conversation with you and thank you for accepting the invitation to be the first for this style of in conversation pieces with me. Thank you and all the best with your move to Edinburgh and all of your future work. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. It's been a pleasure to be here with you. Brilliant. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as I mentioned at the start, keep watching for information on how to find out more about Bethany's work through the School of Divinity at Edinburgh University. Also, to learn more about past and future series of Gilbert Scott Lectures on Science and Faith at Liverpool Cathedral, and to sign up for our email newsletter so that you can get information on all forthcoming events at Liverpool Cathedral straight to your inbox. Many thanks for joining us. 
do look out for further events and conversations and lectures. Take care and may God bless us all and goodbye for now.